there Muna and this is my shed I'm back again this is um, episode two of Una's musings on uh, becoming unbecoming which is this book here uh, the UK edition um, which is a little bit different from the other English language version which is the North American edition <clears throat> the UK edition is uh, published by Myriad editions here we go it's their logo uh, <laughs> and it was published in 2015 the north american edition it was published in 2016 and it's with a canadian publisher called arsenal pulp um whichever edition you've got i hope that this is a useful addition to your enjoyment of the book now um episode one is already on my channel um episode one of me reading and also episode one of me uh, rambling on about the drawings and so on um, this takes up at the end of episode one at the page where we saw the cut out dolls and the nurse's uniform and the uh, brownies uniform all of that uh, this episode does contain um, a lot more difficult stuff i suppose so just to kind of forewarn you if you're a little bit sensitive to that kind of thing the way the book's written and drawn is um, meant to try to um, allow people the space to process what's happening um, so hopefully it's gentle enough for the majority of my audience so um, I'm just going to kind of talk you through some of the drawings, some of my thoughts about, uh, in hindsight, about the book and um, this particular uh, extract, which takes us from the page, um, which I think is 33 with the nurse's outfit, to the page uh, 51, which is where my reputation goes down the drain. Uh, <laughs> so... Thinking about the, um, well, the nurses are really poignant right now because we're all in isolation and everybody's thinking about medical staff and porters and hospital cleaners and all of that. Um, I would have been a really terrible nurse because I'm quite um, squeamish, even with my own kids. I, I, I find it really difficult. You know, one time, the luckily, they've not really suffered a lot of injuries, but um, I have been pretty useless uh especially when I had to take one to the hospital and a nurse was um, putting iodine on his hand that had gone septic oh dearie me so that would have been um yeah it wouldn't have been a career of choice for me however I did have a lovely uh kind of 1950s style nurse's outfit probably sometime around 1970 or 1971 uh, I wished for it in a wishing well and I got my wish there you go my brownies uniform did look like that and I did have knickers that had Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and so on. And I used to get quite annoyed when I had to wear um, the wrong day, you know, because of laundry um, flow problems. So, yeah, I was always a bit of an odd kid. So then we turn the page and we see uh, Una sitting on a little hill and she's kind of leaning on a tree and then there are hills opposite uh, with kind of clouds and trees and figures and then we see the den. Now the, the hills were an early sort of uh, motif that I drew. I suppose I was thinking about a landscape of misogyny. I was thinking about Yorkshire and the the geography of the region which is very um it's kind of combination of uh very industrial and very uh, uh rural and it, it's pretty hilly there are lots of there's lots of kind of um, quite sort of strong weather you know quite intense kind of rain and wind so a lot of the trees are kind of very gnarly and there's some beautiful moors there's really good moorland um uh, my next book actually eve a lot of it is, is kind of based on the colors of ilkley moor where i spend quite a lot of time um it's quite it's kind of bleak but also really beautiful yorkshire um if you haven't been you probably should as soon as this lockdown ends um although pro probably not all on the same day that would ruin it for everyone else anyway 
so <clears throat> so here we've got this kind of depiction of what happened when I met my second predatory man um, who I think I've called here Terry that's not what his name was he told me his name was Jamie um, so there you go and I had to change their names in the book because at the time I had reported to the police and I was hopeful that something might come of it nothing did um, but I didn't want to prejudice any court case so I think for this Una's musings I should probably use their hope well I think that Jamie actually was his real name some of them probably gave me false names so um, first there was Damien who said he wouldn't hurt me then there was Terry or Jamie who said he was my boyfriend that particular day I was wearing jeans I'm sure the same thing happened to my den making friend though we never spoke of it and now okay this is a re the really sad thing about growing up at the time that I did was that people were not speaking of it and and outside of uh, feminism outside of women's services women and girls were also not speaking to each other about it I think this is a, a terrible kind of time to live through in that respect um, in in the UK in the western world things have improved and now we're talking to each other much more but there are many many girls who are struggling through this in isolation all over the world um, and you know it's really important to remember that that this is not some kind of uh, past event that's gone now it's not an era that's finished at all for, for very many girls um, it's such a shame that we couldn't uh, communicate that I couldn't communicate with this very close friend of mine who I'm absolutely sure has suffered the same thing that day that I did um, at the age of I think about 12 um, yeah think of how much easier it would have been to cope if I would have been able to do it through friendship think of how much easier it would have been to report to to our parents or to the police if we'd been able to you know hold one another's hands metaphorically speaking through that process and yet both of us just went away by ourselves and struggled alone the um when we turn over the page we see jeans hard wearing casual trousers made of denim or other cotton fabric and it was the 70s so they would have been flared i used to find the button too stiff i kind of i wanted to in, introduce some detail that sort of lets the reader know what was happening and how it happened without being too um without bringing too much prurient detail into it because i didn't want to kind of inadvertently um produce a type of pornography um about my own experience so this is me trying to kind of balance that um, with the idea of the button and the idea of the genes, which also refers to, you know, this problem that people have about uh, what women are wearing, you know, as if that makes any difference at all. Um, it makes no difference what you're wearing or how old you are or where you are. Um, the only thing that makes a difference is the rapist, the only person that's, responsible for rape is a rapist that's the end of that um it'd be a lot easier next time if you wore a skirt yes that is actually what he said and still no one knew or guessed what had happened to me in fact i didn't know what had happened to me and now this page page 37 where i'm wearing this kind of little floral dress and it's um it's the dress that I borrowed from my sister without her knowing and then felt guilty about it and it somehow got inextricably um, bound up with what had happened on the uh, the first time I met a predatory man on the hill. Um, so, yeah, really, um, this page, it's, it's one of the opportunities that I had when I was writing the book to kind of talk to myself, you know, almost like a letter to a younger me. And when people ask me if writing the book was therapeutic, I always say, well, well, no, you know, you, I had the therapy. The therapy came first and then I wrote the book. Um, and I would definitely um, not advise anyone who was is in my position or the position that I used to be in maybe would be more accurate. Um, 
uh, to try to process their experience by publishing a book, you know, by making this kind of thing public. I think that that would um, compound the trauma. I'm not sure how helpful it would be, but um, certainly for me, it was um, a really good way of processing some of the what i'd call the residue sort of this the kind of sticky small residue that was still there that was um, annoying more than anything else and i wanted to um process and be done with it you know leave it behind and and these kind of pages where i'm able to say as as the owner in the book still no one knew or guessed what happened to me I didn't know what happened to me. And then as the adult Una to say, well, you had no meaningful frame of reference. You know, these are sort of things that I know in my head and that I have known for a long time. But until I actually put pen to paper and started to write this book, I don't think I had really believed it in my heart. And so this kind of really helped me to process certain kind of points um to to make something coherent from the political and the personal um which obviously this is the book which is very which very much embodies that idea um the thing about vague warnings about strangers and puppies i mean thankfully today in the uk there are the much better um teaching uh, through safeguarding through schools and through children's services which helps children to identify potential potential dangers um, not just stuff about strangers and puppies strangers in fact um, are generally much safer than people that you know um, or the people that have got to know you i'm actually quite unusual that my first two um, incidents were complete strangers who who groomed me and, and, and got to know me. Um, do people talk about it more nowadays? It doesn't come up naturally in conversations. Um, now, this was a really strange thing because at the time that I was writing the book, all sorts of things were coming out in the news. The Jimmy Savile case was just starting. The Rochdale and Rotherham child sexual exploitation cases were just sort of emerging. Um, I'd like to think that it's become much easier for people to talk about it since I wrote that page. When we turn over, we see um, Una sort of um, in bed with looking at the light coming through the door. And it says, I started to feel scared all the time. And this is a direct reference to the Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, where he wakes in the morning after Gregor Samsa, sorry, the central character, works in the morning after uneasy dreams and finds he's turned into a monstrous creature. Um, I've written the uneasiness of turning into a new creature because I'm thinking that there's a there's a um, there is a connection. There's there's a kind of parallel narrative there that if Gregor Samsa had been a girl, he could have likened this experience of waking up and being. A monstrous creature to the onset of puberty and menstruation and the sudden realization that your purpose in the world is very different um from before and that there's a new ever-present danger um with your body uh on the opposite page you can see the little elements of the drawn character una where tiny dots for eyes and nose and mouth funny little spoons for arms and legs and the red dress and uh, I like this page. It sort of really makes me think about the very early stages when I was wondering how to how to make a character that I could draw repeatedly quite quickly. Um, in the end, the book wasn't very quick, <laughs> actually, but I'm still pleased with the way that Una came out. There's a lot of theory in comics, which is about the, the simplicity of character and how that can help the reader to... Uh, identify with um, characters the, the the simpler the better really and um, that's probably a completely um, separate video I'm sure you can look into that yourselves if you if you're interested when we turn the pages we see two very uh, ornate kind of intricate looking insect this is the first time in the book that you get something that's very kind of heavily drawn I suppose and that's partly because these belong to a previous project where I was thinking about the metamorphosis and I had started drawing uh, all of these kind of different 
creature girls which are a little bit like insects they're the they're elements of insects that i've kind of put together again I, I don't know if anyone ever who grew up in the 70s went to a beetle drive where you had to kind of put different bits of a beetle together and i always wonder if if that's something that influenced these um but mainly i was interested in uh the way when i started drawing them some of the creatures seemed to wear their bodies with more panache and some some of the creatures seemed to be sort of being swallowed by their bodies and it made me think of the way the way it is in puberty um for girls as well as boys you know as, as you grow up it's uh it's such a kind of strange period when your body starts to change and it's very much the case that some uh some kids are much more comfortable in their own skins uh, than others are and that that bears little relationship to the reality of their body too it, it's possible to be you know an, an able-bodied extremely attractive youngster and still feel incredibly uncomfortable and it's also possible to be you know a not conventionally beautiful sort of kid and feel extremely comfortable in your skin uh I think that's a really kind of interesting thing for me because I, I, I did feel very uncomfortable um, in my body. So this was perhaps something that I was trying to sort of work out. Uh, I'm very pleased with them just as drawings though and that's why they're in the book. So we turn over and we get to the page which is about anxiety and about uh my obsessive compulsive behavior uh, which mostly manifested itself in in checking things so i used to have to check things hundreds of times sometimes it it began with you know that something that's very common for children which is checking under the bed or checking in the wardrobe and it sort of developed and evolved into all sorts of other behaviors uh, further down the line but at the start um it was probably relatively normal i can remember my father laughing and saying no oh, there's no monster in the wardrobe that kind of thing but i think what people didn't understand and maybe what they still don't understand i don't think it's particularly clear in this page is that uh, where the wardrobe is sort of slightly hanging open there um una would have had to check get out of bed uh, open the wardrobe door look inside the wardrobe check everything push the clothes around close the door get back into bed get back out of bed look in the wardrobe do it again close the door get back into bed get back out of bed and so on hundreds of times um all the time becoming more and more anxious until i was just exhausted and fell asleep um really sort of combating anxiety is so important for people who are survivors it's i can't overstress that there's some stuff on my facebook page at the moment because of the situation that we're all in with the coronavirus lockdown and a lot of people are experiencing a lot of anxiety where i've described the um methods that i use the exercises that i do to uh, combat well I, I don't really suffer from anxiety anymore but when i, I did it was crippling and I, I was able to more or less cure myself just through doing relaxation and breathing exercises and retraining myself to notice when i felt anxious before it turned into a panic attack so if that's you then you can look on my uh, facebook and you will find it as my pinned post at the moment um with drawings for how to do the relaxation exercises that i practiced so uh still i didn't tell on page 43 and then we turn over and we go back again to the original incident in the book with um, Damien, he's called in the book, he's, he actually told me that his name was um, Ian. I hadn't been alarmed at first, it was um, as though he was just passing casually, he didn't make me feel nervous or uncomfortable. This, is, this refers back to um, an earlier page which is about the 14 year old girl who goes to the police and um, explains to them about how she met Peter Sutcliffe on a, a walk home and that he didn't make her feel nervous or uncomfortable and I think that this is is it's an important sort of line because of the idea that somehow predatory or dangerous men are noticeable because of their behavior when they're not actually they are very practiced 
at um, soothing their victims because you know they obviously they don't want they want to do what they want to do and they don't want to alarm you. Um, they're good at grooming people and they're good at um, imitating a person who means no harm. I think this is a really important thing to understand. That he shouted, come back, I won't hurt you, I think is a really important thing too. Because it's only in hindsight that I realised that he couldn't run after me as I ran away. Um, because he had his trousers down, so he couldn't run very fast. There are two sets of panels here. In the top set of panel, it's basically a hill and a figure. Um, and my head turns into the hill. So, you know, it's really nice sometimes when you're drawing a graphic novel to have some kind of motif that that repeats itself and in Becoming Unbecoming, it's this kind of shape, the form of the hill and the use of the frame, the kind of um, the way the hill is positioned and so on. And you can see the same thing is happening in the little panels at the bottom where Una is dressed as a princess in her sister's dress. Now, I did I wasn't actually wearing a crown. That's just to kind of indicate the princessness. And and this is it's a little bit like earlier on in the book where you saw the um, alternative endings for 1975 for the women who were um, injured but survived uh, an attack by Peter Sutcliffe, where I indicated that, you know, for for the first happy ending well she would have just shouted at her partner who was fast asleep and then got bored and gone home and then the second uh, woman would have stopped outside the chip shop realized it was closed and just gone home disappointed and the third case uh, the 14 year old girl she would have um you know her shoes would have hurt and she would have walked home and then she would have been very relieved when she saw the lights of her house and that's how these stories should have ended and the way my story should have ended is that I should have run around on a hillside pretending to be a princess and picking daisies and making daisy chains and then I would have just gone home in peace. This is what we want for our girls all over the world. The next page um, is another page where I'm kind of talking to myself. Um, you'd think I'd be put off intimacy by what happened to me, but it doesn't often work like that. And I actually, um, I did enlist the help of a friend who works in safeguarding to get the wording right on this page. I thought it was quite important to make sure that, um, that I wasn't sort of compounding any errors. Because, you know, although I'm an expert on my own life, as we all are, um, I'm not an expert on um, safeguarding children. So, it, you know, it's... It's good to know when you need help. That's part of part of being um, a good writer, I think. Then we turn over the page and to one of my favourite pages, <laughs> where it says hindsight is a marvelous thing. And these are the original inky mountains and the inky trees that I drew right at the start of the project when I wasn't even sure that it was a book. Um, yeah, these are really some of my favorite moments then we go to the article on page 48 an open message to the ripper so this is um the it's set out exactly like the original page which i i spent some time in the library doing research in leeds central library looking at pages from the yorkshire evening post from 1975 to 1981 and collecting information and so I read this on the original page and I tried to set the type in the same way that it had been set in the original. So it's exactly the same. The phone numbers are the same. The wording is the same. I know that I, I hadn't read this for a long time until I read um, the book for the, you know, these YouTube videos. And it's still shocking that any police force would think that it was appropriate to print something like this. Um, below you can see Una on a kind of tightrope. I like the fact that the third one down, she's sort of just fallen off a little bit and you can see her legs sticking out. She's kind of hanging onto the rope and then she recovers herself. Um, and below are as many words as I could find 
that means slut or slag or whore in different languages. And the way I got these, I kind of crowdsourced them by um, using my Facebook account and asking all the friends that I knew who, who speak different languages, you know, could you just tell me how you say whore or slut or slag in your language? So, yeah, crowdsourced there. Then we look at the page opposite, uh, page 49, and we see that when I was um, insulted by a group of boys walking past my house, the person to blame was me. Don't you ever, I never want to hear anything like that again. Do you hear? Um, this really reinforced for me the idea that I was responsible for, for things that other people did that um i had no control over the things that other people did to me and yet i was somehow responsible um for all of it i think this is central to misogyny to the misogynistic idea that vic victims of sexual violence are somehow responsible for their own fate and that um if you haven't been a victim of sexual violence it must be because you've done the right things somehow you know um, and that men are just excused um, for their bad behaviour by this uh, misogynistic kind of culture. In the sort of bottom panel there, you can see that this is repulsive. I think I've called him Robert in the book, but he was actually called Richard. He was another older man. And I can see now that this was a case of child sexual exploitation. But I thought that he was my boyfriend. Everybody else thought he was repulsive. I thought he was repulsive. Uh, but my mother found out about this and she took me to the doctor to be put on the pill. So this is at the age of about 13. She didn't want me to suffer the way that she had. Um, okay, so there are lots of questions raised there. It makes me wonder why did no one call social services when when someone was, when a doctor was putting a 13 year old on the pill? Um, all sorts of things go, uh, <laughs> make me wonder. I can completely understand why my mother didn't want me to get pregnant because to her it was the pregnancy, the fact that she'd had my sister, as you remember at the start of the book, out of wedlock. This was the thing that was worse for her. Um, and she presumably couldn't comprehend at the time what was actually happening to me and that it was uh, the rape that was the worst thing. An unfortunate side effect of the contraceptive pill was that when they found out I took it, boys felt even more entitled to my body. I didn't find love, but I lived in hope, which insistently triumphed over experience. Again, you know, I was 13. I was deeply immature. But what I did know was this little body of text at the bottom that the rule was that girls were supposed to keep boys under control and I didn't seem able to do this. I think as well that although I wasn't really aware of it and I mostly felt just like I was kind of chubby, I think, rather than, you know, that my body was developing into with breasts and thighs and so on. Um, somehow people were alarmed by this. You know, there's the line here. Although the rate at which girls grew was completely beyond their control, they had to be careful not to let their breasts and thighs alarm people. Girls were required to do sexual things to be thought desirable, but they had to do these things without revealing their own needs. I think this is a really interesting kind of contradiction, isn't it? That girls are, are or certainly were, when I was growing up, they were simultaneously expected to be extremely sexy, but also not to let their sexuality alarm anyone, you know, or disturb anything. Strange times. I'm very glad that girls are allowed to have a sexuality today. Um, very, very glad about that. And then to finally, on page 51, this is where we leave this episode of the book. Um, this is how I found out I had something called a reputation that I was supposed to have been looking after. I didn't even get a good look at it before it was gone. And here we have a lot of ink pouring down the drain. I had a couple of conversations with my editor Corinne Perlman about this you know what does a reputation look like and this is um, what I decided it looked like I hope you agree and I'll see you again soon for episode three